All right, we're back with this series on why you need a, a building permit, what goes into or what it. you need to get a building permit. Yeah, if you even need one. Right. So we're looking into it. This In this episode, we're going to talk about additions a little bit more, get into the details of that. Uh, before we get started, make sure you dingle on the bell down there and uh, hit the subscribe button. And of course, leave us a comment. Tell us what boneheads we are. Uh, that's great. Whatever you want to do. Make a comment down below. We're, we're here to, to listen and hopefully help you out. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start the share. Okay. And pick up where we left off from last week. And that is additions. Yep. Okay. So last week, just if you didn't listen to last week's show, we were talking about doing uh, basically interior remodels or alterations. And in that case, you're really just going to need probably a, a building permit a set of plans just showing the as is and what you're adding and maybe some electrical notes and things like that. Um, and, and pretty much that's going to pretty much cover you for the most part. Um, we also want to remind you is make sure before you go submit anything or get started even drawing it, it's a good idea to reach out to your building department and see what they require on your drawings so that you can submit the drawings complete and not have to go the, through the whole revision process. So that's what brings us to doing additions. Once you start doing an addition, you're going to have to do a little bit more work. You're going to want to have drawings showing all the existing and the proposed alterations. So you can see in the top of that picture, that's the as-built house. And you can see it looks like over there by the garage or whatever. And then they're going to they're going to build on to that. So they're building that wing. Oh, that's right in here. Yeah. yeah they're going to bring that wing out there. So that all has to be documented, how this house looks now and what they're adding. And this one's a little more expensive because they're doing like, they got to show you the 3D views, the new kitchen. But that's what you're going to want to see is the level one existing, level two existing. And then you've got the other two floor plans, which are your new revised floor plans. Now, on, on the existing, it's just basically showing you structure, walls, basically yep. room divisions. It's not getting into much detail. Uh, a lot of the existing sometimes will actually have what what areas are getting removed, what gets demoed, what doesn't. Uh, and again, as a reminder, if you watched last week, I said this, but we did a whole series on what should be on your drawings. Yes. And Ron brings up a good point. Those drawings, even though it shows the existing floor plan, rooms that are being de demolished, walls that are being removed, electrical that is being killed, all that should be shown on there. We call it, we don't call it level one existing, level two existing. It's called an as is demo plan. Right. So it shows the building department what everything is that's there. The demo part of it is for your subcontractors so that when they let their guys lose, they're not just trashing. Right. And they're taking but at least on walls. here. When they go to the proposed plans, they are showing electrical locations. They're showing all the dimensions. You know, they're getting further into detail. They've got the window schedule numbers on there. So the proposed plans are better, but I I think that the uh, original existing are underdeveloped. On, on this particular one. Right. But now because you're going outside the existing footprint of the house, it's going to mean you're now going to need a site plan. Because that site plan, number five there, site plans are going to start showing you all the existing and proposed alterations, how it's going to affect your land. Right. So you need to start showing all your setbacks, what's new, what's existing, where your, you know, where your building line set bar, setbacks are. This happens to be a commercial job with parking spaces. It was probably unfortunate, it was the best thing I could find at the moment for the site plan. Uh-huh. Uh, you're also gonna want to have you might want to get elevations. Uh, I think I did that on six. You've got elevations to the exterior of the building. Yeah, there you go. So that's a well done elevation. Yes. Um, if a you lot notice, of detail. A lot of detail. They call out what the finished materials are. They call out the shapes of everything. Um, you can go so far as to call out the vendor or the manufacturer. But a well detailed elevation like this is going to allow you to put a job out for bid and really not get screwed. Yeah, so no, when we talk never... about this, and you really can't see it on this drawing that well, but if you look all the way to the right, you'll see the list of numbers. It'll show the floor line. It'll show the wall height. 
but it's also showing you. There we go, right in there. ceiling height on the second floor. Yep. And typically we have to go one step further. You're gonna to wanna to find out what your maximum roof height is in your municipality and how it's measured. <laughs> yeah. If it's because been... this is, so you giggle about it, but some places go to your ridge. Maybe it's 38 feet to the ridge. Right. But some places it's the mean roof height. So yeah. you take the overall height of the roof and it's the middle. That's mean. Middle means more, just as much above as there is below, mean. Right. Not average. Average is different. So, but then where do you start the measure? Like, this is a perfect example. Do you start it right here at the front door? Or do you start it over here at the, where you've actually got- Well, usually they say first floor line. Yeah. So, depends on where they're, where they measure it, you know? Yes. So we've had See, some- That's one of those reasons why we say contact your municipality before you start drawing or having it drawn. So, you, you know, if you're hiring a design professional, then they'll probably know who to call. That's a good way to go. But if you don't, or you can do it yourself, or, you know, maybe the building department says, yeah, just bring us a sketch. Well, this is what you need to know. Do you have a maximum roof height? If so, where's it measured from and to? So it's a mean roof height or whatever. Yep. So that's the foundation plan, pretty basic. Right. So walk around that. You've got what we call string dimensions, and then we've got overall dimensions. Right String here. dimensions are typically really important right there where you're at. Those are the cutouts for the garage overhead doors. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have that column there in the middle between each of those doors. But now you know exactly where those are. So those little short dimensions are all called string dimensions. The overall then is the overall on the outer side. Right. Oh, and this one's got a pole in the middle. Yeah, you got, yep, so, you got, so you have a, a footing right there. And go to the basement floor plan and you can see a whole number of spread footings. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. And then you've got a beam pocket, which will tell you to depress the concrete somewhere so that the beam can sit in the foundation wall. That's right there. It's starting to get really mm -hmm. blurry, but yeah. Right. It's there. So that's what the foundation plan is also that should be in your, you know, that you'll get with the foundation plan because that's where the, the building department knows what you're doing to hold the whole project done. So then like where I live though, we have to have, uh, we have to have engineering done for what we call HVWZ, which is high velocity wind zone. Okay. Hurricanes. <laughs> yeah. But, and I think you're gonna have to see the Midwest starting to adapt some of this stuff because with tornado damage. So oh, yeah. if you go, go to eight. Yep. So this is a shear wall. So the shear wall is made to be strong. And if you look at that, it's showing you anchorages. So we frame walls like this all the time, right? A couple of 16 penny nails to put the header in. We put a couple of nails here, a couple of nails there. Right. But if you look at this, there are galvanized steel reinforcement at all those interconnections. By yeah. strapping everything, you don't lose your roof. You don't have roof peel off. People don't realize, especially tornadoes, once you lose a window, that wind blowing in pressurizes, lifts the roof off. You right. know? So by strapping everything down, and I think that's what you're going to see in, you know, unfortunately, Iowa and Oklahoma and, you know, parts of Illinois that have just recently been struck with a lot of uh, tornadoes, is they're going to have to amend their building code. And even if they don't amend the code, you're going to have to go out and buy some strapping. So it's really important that sheer wall cells. So some of the places are going to want that engineering, so make sure you have that. Well, uh, and they are around here. We're having to do more and more hurricane straps and all the rafter ties and um, floor joists. And set. They're, they're starting to make us do that. A lot of municipalities require it now. So The windows, window and door vent schedule? Nine. There you go. All right. So whoever did that front elevation probably did this too. <laughs> Yes. Now, this is probably a commercial job, to be honest with you. But again, if you spend a few minutes doing this, it saves so much trouble. So there's a few things that should be on your window and door schedule. It's not just pretty looking doors, but all those words and numbers written in there. What it's showing you is the sizes of the openings, whether the glass is tempered, not tempered. It will tell you if it's a means of egress. It should have its net clear opening. 
And then part of that would be the light and vent schedule because you're required to have 8% light in a room and 4% vent. Mm -hmm. So a window, it might have, let's say you got a piece of glass that's two foot by four foot, that's eight clear, eight square feet of light. Right. But if it only opens one third of the way, you still might only get two square feet of venting. So you have to figure out how many square feet are in the room. Yeah. Say 100. So if you've got 100 square feet, you need eight square feet of light and four square feet of vent. So every window manufacturer knows this. Sure. The next thing is your size of your window would be where your sill height is because you can't be over 41 inches above finished floor for sill height. And then that opening has to be I believe 20 by 30 minimum. And that's so a fireman can get through with his apparatus on. Right. And, you know, the, the vent part of it, if you've got a casement window that cranks wide open, well, you're going to get pretty close to the same amount of vent as you do light. But on a double hung, you're only getting half the vent. So that's that's part of it. So, yes. And then for egress, they'll either put an E there, it might be an asterisk. You know, you have to just look at the catalog and it'll tell you if it needs egress. It's not like you go out there physically measure all your windows, but then you just need to make sure that your sill heights are right. You know, sure. you can't put the window too high for privacy because that also means you can't get out in case of a fire <laughs> or your kids can't. You know what I mean? So that's why right. all this stuff comes about for a good reason. Right. So, okay. So let's go to number 10, which I'm, is going to be the last one I'm going to talk about with getting a building permit for a an addition. So I don't believe you guys have this, but everybody that's in a flood zone does. Yeah. So FEMA has what they call the 50% rule. So if you're in a, 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 a hazardous flood zone, coastal, we call it AE. So if you're in AE zones, FEMA has a requirement that if your first floor line is below base, is at base flood or less than less than one foot above base flood. If your first floor line is not one foot above base flood zone, you're only allowed to put 50% of the assessed value of your structure. Dirt's not included. Okay. So let's say your house is, you know, you could have a property worth 800,000, but if the dirt is worth, you know, 500,000, you now have a $300,000 house, yes? Right. Which means if you want to put money into your house, you can only put $150,000 in over five years. <laughs> so what happens is if you put that much into your house in year one, that means you can do nothing to your house, basically, for the wow. next four. So that's why it's really important with the FEMA 50% rule. A, understand what it does. How does it restrict you? And where do the numbers come from? Right. But see, we have to stay away from floodplains. There's there's so many feet away from a a hundred year flood, you know, or or a a, a ten year flood. Wait. They they won't allow us even to encroach into that. There's just you just can't do it. It's just not it can't right. be done. So. But yes, a lot of people aren't aware of the fifty percent rule, and it hurts because then they want to do work on their house. And the first thing I ask them for is an elevation certificate, which we'll talk about more in the next uh, next week's show when we talk about what you need for permit when it comes to new construction, yeah. because that really comes into play also. But if you're purchasing a house and you don't know about this rule and you're, you're going to buy a house and think, oh, I'm going to put this addition on. It'll be great. Uh, we'll have a great house. And then you get back, you know, you get smacked in the head with this rule. It. It's that's something that you should really should know about before you even possibly even buy the house. So the 50% rule is based on this elevation certificate. So the top portion is pretty much straightforward. It's your name and address, the property location and all that. But when you get down into the flood insurance rate map, it's called FIRM, F-I-R-M. Yep, right that's here. what we call it. You go to the FIRM map and you look at that up. It's going to tell you what zone you're in. Okay. So I'm in AE8. AE means extreme coastal, eight foot base. Uh huh. That would actually go right there on that. You can see there it says flood zone AE. Right. And to the right is that. What does that say? It says 20. 20 foot. Yeah. Base flood elevation zone, flood depth 20 foot. Yeah. So that would mean my house would be have to be at 21 feet. So. 
if you bought a house in this area, and I believe this says East Baton Rouge, yep. Louisiana. Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. If you're going to buy that house, you'd want to ask for this elevation certificate, and you want to make sure that the first floor of that house that you're looking at is at least one foot above that base floor. Right. If it is, your insurance is, is fairly inexpensive. It might be $1,000 a year. That's basically their bottom line at now. It used to be six hundred. Uh huh. If you're at, say, you bought the house and it's at fifteen, you either a may not be able to get flood insurance, or b it could be twenty thousand dollars a year. Wow! Yeah. And just for not finding out where the first floor line is. So with that, hopefully you got a better understanding of what you need for an addition. There, there are some basic details we went over. There's a lot more that would be involved. Obviously, again. Go check it with, with your municipality. You can go online. They'll give you a list of the, the, the specifications they're required to, uh, that they're asking for and that you're required to give them. Your architect should know a lot of that stuff. Now you're starting to get into structural engineering and, and things like that, uh, that, that you're probably going to need a structural engineer for if your municipality requires that. So dig into this stuff a little bit more. And we kind of just touched on this at the very end. If you're just looking to buy a house, make sure that all this stuff can be done. You you don't want to buy the house and then find out it's in a floodplain. You can't build and you, you can't do anything with it. Right. So and now and now you're stuck with it and you got to sell it. Who wants to buy a house that's in a floodplain? So, you know, there's all those things to kind of take into consideration. So uh before we go, make sure you just hit that subscribe button, dingle on the bell, and of course leave us a comment below. And with that, I'll say keep it square and level. Until next time. Until next time. There you go. And oh, hey. Part three. Stay tuned for part three. It's coming up next week.